This is CBN News Watch. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm George Thomas. Facebook recently released its civil rights audit. The social media giant says it's all part of an effort to fight hate speech on its platform. But some say the tech giant's new policies take direct aim at the conservative movement. Charlene Aaron has more on this story from our CBN News newsroom. Charlene. George, the audit was headed by former ACLU director Laura Murphy. Several of the initiatives announced called for even more censorship than Facebook already has, which is a major concern of conservatives. Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg said in a statement, civil rights are the foundation of a free and just society and something we care deeply about as a company. We want to make sure every, that we're advancing civil rights on our platform. And the social media giant plans the following actions, a civil rights task force to speed up implementation of the demands and complaints made by civil rights organizations, election involvement. Facebook is committed to work with civil rights experts as part of its 2020 election team protecting immigrants in the 2020 census. The tech company plans to partner with census protection groups to flag for review by Facebook potentially suppressive census-related content they encounter. Now, many conservatives already feel like second-class citizens on social media. They say the results of the audit ignore their concerns and only goes after the issues that liberals care about while downplaying freedom of speech. For example, Blaze TV host Graham Allen was recently banned from Facebook after issuing a call to pray for President Trump. I made a video and I basically captioned it saying, real Christians pray for everyone. And uh, a couple days later, I got a notification from Facebook that I had violated their community standards for hate speech. So they took the video down, they removed it. I got no appeal process, no anything. And I just found it incredibly, incredibly sad that calling for prayer for the president of the United States uh, was considered hate speech. Now, President Trump has accused Twitter of bias and censorship of conservative content. He said in a recent interview on Fox Business, what they did to me on Twitter is incredible. I have millions of followers, but I will tell you, they make it very hard for people to join me in Twitter and they make it very much harder for me to get out the message. Meanwhile, the Free Speech Alliance issued a statement on Facebook's audit saying that the company getting in bed with these liberal organizations, especially in its efforts to prepare for the 2020 elections, should be deeply alarming to the conservative movement, Congress, potentially the FEC, and indeed all Americans. This was a big mistake on Facebook's part. We hope they will rethink the decisions they have made. George? Joining me now with more is Dan Gaynor from the Media Research Center. So, Dan, uh, what's your reaction to this latest audit from uh, Facebook? Are you surprised at all? Uh, surprised, no. Disappointed, yes. Uh, you know, here we are. It's been more than a year that uh, Senator John Kyle was doing supposedly a similar audit of conservatives. We've heard no, you know, no hide nor hair of, of that. But this is the second time we've seen uh, Facebook wrap its arms around the product of the former head of the ACLU and 90 liberal groups, all getting basically control of the most powerful social media company in the history of mankind. What are some concerns uh, over the civil rights audit, knowing uh, conservative experts uh, were not included? Well, I mean, first of all, calling it civil rights is one of those when you know one of those misnomers, they're they're left they're leftist groups. That's what that's what it is, and uh, what what this audit did is it gives them control of every aspect of Facebook organization. It puts it creates sort of what they call a civil rights infrastructure, and uh, the, the overarching over across the entire organization, everything from content, the product itself, advertising. Uh, and even human relations, you know, human relations. So basically, the hiring and firing. Uh, this is an organization that's already stocked with liberals, and now liberals are going to control more of who they hire. Uh, what can Facebook uh, do to make some positive changes for not just conservatives but also liberals? Well, I, mean, I think they should embrace the Free Speech Alliance, which the MRC heads up. My boss Brent Bozell, uh, you know, heads up has more than fifty conservative organizations. 
member, members of it, and we call for several things of transparency and such. But if you sum it up into the fourth item that we call for, and that is for them to embrace the ideals of the First Amendment. We know that constitutionally, I don't have a right, you don't have a right to be on Facebook. But if they were to embrace the ideal of the First Amendment, then, then free speech becomes more important to them than safety. And so we can all be offended, but we can all actually still have our free speech online, free speech to, and freedom of religion and freedom of press, all the things that are in the First Amendment. Uh, so as they fight this new initiative of uh, hate speech, uh, talk about the uh, pressure uh, that this puts uh, on Facebook's uh, uh, moderators. Well, what, what's happened is there's, there's global pressure, first of all, that uh, there's numerous organizations or numerous countries that have teamed up with these social media companies to try to restrict speech following the horrific terror attack in New Zealand. And so now what they've done, they've, they've assigned certain key moderators to only look at hate speech. But remember, a lot of what they're doing here is they're saying now they're going to go after not just so-called white nationalism, but they're going after anything that looks like that. Well, according to the left, anybody who voted for Donald Trump, 60-some million Americans, well, then, according to the, the left, many of the organizations that Facebook is probably consulting with, they consider that to be hate speech, rooting for Donald Trump. So that's the danger here. Once you start censoring in bulk like they're doing, there's no end to it. Uh, real quickly, last few seconds, where else have you seen this uh, kind of obvious uh, bias? Oh, well, the, all the major tech companies are like this, uh, in varying degrees. Uh, Twitter's the worst. Google and YouTube have problems. So Facebook naturally has problems as well. And as always, pleasure to have you on this show and a happy fourth to you. Thank you. Happy fourth to you as well. Thank you, sir. There is growing concern about the border as lawmakers visit during the 4th of July recess week. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus visited the Clint Detention Facility in El Paso, Texas, and said they saw a broken system and human rights being abused. We had a chance to visit with about 15 or 20 mothers, some of whom had, had been at that Border Patrol station for over 50 One days. Home, some had been separated from their kids. When we went into the cell, it was, it was clear that the water was not running. There was a toilet, but there was no running water for people to drink. At the same time, a group of Hispanic pastors visited the Clint facility over the weekend and reported good conditions for the children there. Pastor Sam Rodriguez, one of the president's faith advisors, told reporters in a press call that he asked the White House for a tour after reading accounts from a team of lawmakers, lawyers rather, who visited and described the children in dire straits. Rodriguez said the lawyers did not tour the facility as the pastors did, but he also noted that the lawyers spoke directly with the children and the pastors did not. We found no soiled diapers, no deplorable conditions, and no lack of basic necessities. We toured the entire facility and had conversations with those on the ground, which revealed, by the way, that the original report regarding soiled diapers, deplorable conditions, and lack of basic hygiene and sanitary items, items arrived via the conduit of attorneys interviewing children some who were as young as six years old, attorneys who may have political affiliations. And that's the understanding, by the way. Rodriguez uh, com uh, commended the Border Patrol agents for their compassionate care for the children. Agents are under the spotlight this week after ProPublica reported that agents in a closed Facebook group have posted sexist comments and mocked migrant deaths. The head of Border Patrol says those agents will be held accountable. In political news, last week's debates apparently shifted the Democratic race for the presidency. That's according to a new CNN poll. Former Vice President Joe Biden still leads, but he fell dramatically with just 22 percent. That's a 10 percent drop. California Senator Kamala Harris jumped nine points into second with 17 percent, while Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren moved up eight points to third at 15 percent. And Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders fell to fourth at 14 percent. President Trump and the Republican Party have raised $105 million for his 2020 re-election campaign in the second quarter. That number beats out President Barack Obama's during his re-election campaign in the second quarter of 2011. And although early polls have found the president trailing behind Democrats, the joint 
Fundraising efforts gives the president a significant edge against the Democratic field. We will have more on this story and others on Faith Nation this evening. As always, you can watch it right here on the CBN News channel. A Ten Commandments plaque dating back to the 1920s has been removed from an Ohio middle school. This plaque has been on display at Welty Middle School in New Philadelphia for 92 years. That is until the Freedom From Religion Foundation demanded that it be taken down. The atheist group claims the plaque was, quote, flagrant violation of the establishment cause of the First Amendment. The school says although they do not agree with the Freedom From Religion Foundation, they will not fight the group in court. A Jesus sign in Hawkins, Texas, has been removed from its display on the highway. The Jesus welcomes you to Hawkins sign was put up by the Jesus Christ Open Altar Church in 2015. It has been uh, the subject of contention for a number of years. The owners of the church wanted to keep the sign. The city did not. The city removed the sign last week for, quote, safety reasons. The owners of the church disagree with the move and plan to file a federal lawsuit. Angry uh, young voters in, uh, sorry, try that again. Angry young protesters in Hong Kong turned violent out of frustration over the administration's deaf ears to their demand for the withdrawal of controversial extradition bill. Lucille Talusan has more from Hong Kong. Hong Kong riot police launched tear gas at hardcore protesters after they violently stormed into the Legislative Council building. A dramatic ending to what would have been a peaceful celebration of the 22nd anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong to mainland China. In 1997, China agreed to a one country, two systems arrangement, granting Hong Kong its own economic and legal system for 50 years. But in recent years, Hong Kong resident Xi Beijing increasingly imposing its sovereignty over Hong Kong, most recently in a controversial extradition bill giving China the right to take people accused of crimes from Hong Kong to the mainland. Monday's traditional March for Democracy turned into a march of protest against the bill. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets shouting for the complete withdrawal of the bill and the resignation of Chief Executive Carrie Lam. I would say that under the hardline suppression of President Xi, people around the world might have hesitation and might try to keep silence. But we will not step backward until the day we have democracy. Protesters charged that Beijing is not keeping its part of the agreement, allowing Hong Kong to keep elements of independence. They still have 28 years to go before that agreement ends, but they can already see uh, and experience suppression from uh, Beijing. And that is why we can see how angry they are. They are determined to fight for the rights that they can still enjoy uh, in the remaining 28 years. Many Christians are joining the protests, gathering to worship and pray before marching in the streets. We can encourage certain Christians to come out. <laughs> Our purpose is to pray for Hong Kong. Then one day, the police shout against the demonstrator, ask your Jesus to come down. <laughs> but we told them, Jesus is here. <laughs> so I think it is a good witness. Pastor Yoon asks for more prayers, especially in the aftermath of the chaos that has now put Hong Kong in a more volatile political situation. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Hong Kong. Coming up, why one best-selling author says schools should be teaching all religions. That story in a moment. Roman soldiers destroy the Second Temple of Jerusalem. Centuries of eyewitnesses say the temple treasures survived. But where are they? They went from Jerusalem to Rome, Rome to Carthage, Carthage to Byzantium. Historians are silent about what happened to it next. This is a bad omen. Hosted and narrated by Gordon Robertson. So does it still exist today? CBN Documentaries presents a story of mystery. Where is it? Calamity. Most of the victims were butchered. And destiny. The possibility to dig is impossible. 
Take a journey to find Treasures of the Second Temple, a CBN Documentaries presentation coming July 8th. Remember for a moment what it was like to be a child. You believed every story you were told. You saw a world full of endless possibilities. What stories will the world's orphaned and at-risk children believe? We believe the Bible tells the only story truly worth believing. We believe that every child should have the opportunity to dream, the chance to take challenges and turn them into possibilities, the chance to stand on the promises of God, to recognize their place in the greatest story ever told. They have their whole lives ahead of them. Theirs is a world of endless possibilities. They are looking for a story to believe. We will tell them that story. Will you join us? Welcome back to the CBN News Channel. There's been a big push for Bible literacy in the public schools this year. Lawmakers in at least six states proposed legislation to encourage elective classes in Bible, and seven states have these classes already. But New York Times best-selling author Stephen Mansfield says the U.S. needs to brush up not just on the Bible, but all religions. He's written extensively on politics and religion and joins me now. So, Stephen, you recently wrote an op-ed piece in which you said that uh, the U.S., has a religion problem. What, what, what do you mean by that? Well, it's very obvious from the survey that we as Americans do not understand real religions. It's uh, the, you've probably seen Jay Leno walking the streets a program of years ago and asking people about religions, asking people about the Bible. It's stunning what we don't know. And this can lead to real tragedy. Right after 9-11, a number of Sikhs were shot in Arizona and in Texas. One in, in uh, Texas was killed because the people who were committing the crime didn't know the difference between a Muslim and a Sikh. Now, any shooting has been horrible, but this just illustrates how ignorant we are of religion. And this really falls to the schools. Religion can be taught as an academic course in the schools. Uh, you, also argue, you also argue, Stephen, that our poor understanding of religion is uh, affecting the way we do business uh, with the rest of the world. How is our ignorance of religion uh, affecting our foreign policy? Well, for example, you know, we're, we've been very involved in Iraq in recent years. And of course, if you do not understand the distinction between a Sunni Muslim and a Shiite Muslim, and then maybe again, the Kurds who are both Sunni and Shiite, uh, you can't really do business in Iraq. And there's pretty good evidence uh, that not only the, the George W. Bush administration, and of course, I wrote The Faith of George W. Bush, so I'm a, uh, I'm a supporter of the president, but uh, he did not understand the distinction between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Uh, many of our diplomats did not understand this distinction between Sunni and Shiites. And, of course, many of our troubles there in, quote-unquote, nation-building uh, were because of tensions between Sunni and Shiites. That's going on to this day. So if we're trying to do good around the world, if we're trying to engage in an effective American foreign policy, and we don't understand the religions on the ground, uh, we will be unsuccessful. And that's something we've got to correct in our time. Yeah, as, as somebody who has spent a lot of time in the Middle East, to, to understand that basic distinction between those two uh, uh, aspects within Islam is, is quite uh, shocking. Uh, what's the best way, uh, Stephen, to teach religions in public schools? Well, we should be teaching it. We should be teaching it objectively. Uh, even the ACLU, which I usually don't comment on in a positive way, uh, has in a number of its documents said religion and the Bible should be taught objectively in the public schools. It's a legitimate area of intellectual pursuit, and it's something people need to know to be educated, whether we're talking about, as you and I have been, politics and foreign policy, whether we're talking about literature, Shakespeare, uh, et cetera, uh, whether, whatever we're talking about, international trade, you have to understand these religions. And as long as they're taught objectively in the schools, they're part of creating uh, world citizens. They're part of creating people who are knowledgeable. And so we need to restore that, that, uh, that field of study. Part of the problem is that school districts get nervous about religion, think they'll be sued by the ACLU because they might have been for, who knows, a Bible study or a Bible on a teacher's desk. But the ACLU has come out strongly in favor of such courses, and it's time for us to, to see them flourish in our public schools. And if I could just follow up on that particular point, how do we make sure that teachers teach religion in an impa impartial manner? Well, that's all about the engineering of the curriculum. 
Uh, school districts monitor teachers all the time on every subject in terms of how they're teaching it. Uh, but if the curriculum is solid, objective, academic, uh, not, or not evangelistic in any way, not an apology for any religion, uh, but a systematic academic teach uh, course on the religions, then I, then I think, first of all, we've learned that students flock to these courses. And second of all, the school district can easily guarantee that there's no proselytizing going on. And this will make everybody happy from the ACLU to the adherence to those religions. Okay, uh, Stephen, terrific, wonderful insights. And as always, thank you so much for coming on the show and have a fantastic jo uh, July 4th. Thank you, you as well. Thank you, sir. Well, folks, after the break, how a museum in Kentucky is making a difference to its visitors. Remember for a moment what it was like to be a child. You believed every story you were told. You saw a world full of endless possibilities. What stories will the world's orphaned and at-risk children believe? We believe the Bible tells the only story truly worth believing. We believe that every child should have the opportunity to dream the chance to take challenges and turn them into possibilities, the chance to stand on the promises of God, to recognize their place in the greatest story ever told. They have their whole lives ahead of them. Theirs is a world of endless possibilities. They are looking for a story to believe. We will tell them that story. Will you join us? Welcome back to the CBN News Channel. This holiday weekend, families looking for vacation destination that's fun and educational might consider the Creation Museum in Kentucky. As Paul Strand shows us, it could also strengthen your faith. The Creation Museum starts off with those creatures of old who stomp the earth, dinosaurs. No matter how you feel about dinosaurs, we know kids love them, which is why the Creation Museum has made sure to have a ton of dinosaurs. Well many tons. And visitors will hear different stories about them than is taught in most classrooms or spread by secular evolutionists. That's because one of the museum's goals is to illustrate how this is a universe of intelligent design made by a creator god, not just a random evolving and mutating of meaningless matter. One thing that is evolving is the museum itself. The ministry Answers in Genesis, which runs the museum, is making sure it continues to grow. If you haven't been here even in just the last few years, come back and see it, there's a lot more to see. Along with all those dinosaurs lurking about the place, inside the Creation Museum, visitors will see the Garden of Eden, as well as Noah and the Ark, the worldwide flood and a planetarium. Outside, there's also a big petting zoo and zip lines. One reason for the expansion is to accommodate all the new visitors brought here by sister destination, the Ark Encounter. It's only 43 miles away and offers discount tickets to the Creation Museum. We had over 700,000 people the first year that the Ark opened come here. And we consistently over have uh, over half a million visitors, which is you know a couple hundred thousand more than we're used to. The museum staff decided to view this unexpected overcrowding as an opportunity. Let's expand certain areas, let's open things up, let's put in some new exhibits. One thing that won't change is the bottom line message. God's perfect creation may have been tainted by man's sin, but there's a way out. Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, the infinite Son of God took the infinite punishment from the infinite Father. And that was enough to satisfy God's wrath on sin. And that's what makes salvation possible, only through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Creation Museum in Kentucky. 
coming up, hear from the Christian who claims God used his song for North Korea to pave the way for President Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un. Are you suffering from feeling tired or worn out during the day? Can you not turn off your brain at night? You are not alone. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, The Sleep Doctor, and I've partnered with the Christian Broadcasting Network, and we're gonna bring you some unbelievable information that you can use tonight to get a better night's rest. Wake up to your best life. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com to get your free copy of Protect Your Sleep today. If you want to be an attorney with a passion for serving people and for excellence, Regent University needs to be high on your list. Regent's award-winning law school doesn't just create lawyers, we create leaders, judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers, civil litigators and leaders in government. My focus has been trying to really make sure we have the future leaders we need for the, the bench and the bar and for society generally. You'll learn from highly credentialed leaders who are current and former judges, distinguished scholars, and ACLJ counsel. I'm so glad I chose Regent. Uh, the relationships here have been amazing. The faculty have been amazing. Not everybody's called to the same thing when they leave law school, but they're called by a God who has a purpose for their lives, and He is going to use that education to make a difference in the world. Regent will prepare you to be a purpose-driven, practice-ready lawyer. To start your rewarding law career, complete the online application, submit your transcripts, and take the law school admissions test by July. Apply today. If you want to be an attorney with a passion for serving people and for excellence, Regent University needs to be high on your list. Regent's award-winning law school doesn't just create lawyers. We create leaders, judges, prosecutors and defense lawyers, civil litigators, and leaders in government. Ready to become a purpose-driven, practice-ready lawyer? To start your rewarding career, complete the online application, submit your transcripts, and take the law school admissions test by July. Check out the CBN News Daily Rundown podcast each weekday with me, Caitlin Burke. Click on the show tab at cbnnews.com where you can listen and subscribe. Welcome back to the CBN News channel. A Bethel music worship leader says a worship song he wrote eight years ago paved the way for the historic meeting between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Sean Foyt says he wrote the song Finish What You Started, song for North Korea, for the communist nation back in 2012. The song calls for hope and peace. Foyt says it was written in the exact spot of the DMZ where Trump and Kim met to negotiate peace. Foyt says the song is, quote, prophecy fulfilled. He wrote on Instagram, oftentimes we have no idea how God can use our simple songs and prayers to change history. Long ways to go, still celebrating small steps or giant steps, leaps today. Well, that is it for this edition of Newswatch. You can find more on the issues you care most about at cbnnews.com. You can also watch CBN News programs anytime right here on the CBN News channel. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you have seen here. Please email us, newswatch at cbn.com, or you can reach out and touch us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for joining us from all of us here. God bless, and have a great rest of the day.